Hello guys, this is Frank. Before we jump into the fantastic content, I want to mention three things. First, the materials that TC goes through in the three-hour composition course about Prokofiev can be downloaded in our free Composers Toolkit. I will link to that toolkit inside the description box. Second, we want to focus more on long-form content and upload full teaching sessions using interval theory to our YouTube channel. So I hope that this will resonate with you and give you tons of value. And if you see it that way, please share this Prokofiev video with your inner circle. Third, if you want to say hi in person to TC or myself, please join the Virgil campus. It's free to enter, no registration needed, and I would love to meet you in person. So now let's get into the content. To look at uh, one of the really great Russian composers, Kofiov only lived uh, to be 61 years old. He was born in 1891 and died in 1953. And he was a arrogant and eccentric composer. And, you know, Mita has a philosophy. And so we, we got to think about that. Uh, when people write about you in history, some of you are going to be very famous composers, and they talk about how arrogant you were. Let's just address that momentarily. Arrogance to me in the meat of philosophy means you are limited. Now, I know we're talking about a great Russian composer here, but the fact that he was arrogant didn't help him. It had to make his life more difficult. And so it's a little warning to you to make sure that you cultivate your receiving ability to the creative pool, which means you don't own music. It's something you exist with. Being a little bit quirky is fine, but the arrogance is going to get in your way. The thing about Prokofiev is he was very bored with the educational system in Russia. And he came out of the Russian conservatory where most, um, most of his classmates were older than him. He was maybe seven years younger than, than a lot of them. And his, uh, there's, he's, he had a lot of really tough things going on with his piano concertos. They weren't really well received all the time. His second piano concerto, which was played in, uh, I think, 1913, was reviewed. And one of the statements was, the cats on the roof make better music. <laughs> Prokofiev and Stravinsky were friends. Although Stravinsky would say things like, Prokofiev is probably the greatest composer that ever lived after me. <laughs> And uh, Prokofiev also did not really like a lot of Stravinsky's music. And, and see, that's where the arrogance came in because we wouldn't have any idea if Prokofiev liked Stravinsky, Stravinsky's music or not, if there wasn't arrogance involved. So arrogance doesn't perpetuate anything positive generally, other than a reputation that you're arrogant. The interesting thing is uh, we're going to look at the third piano concerto, which is by far his most famous. And I think everyone should know that it was originally recorded in Abbey Road in London with the London Symphony Orchestra. I find that just fantastic. I just read that this morning trying to prepare for this. And I had the luxury of recording a film score with a London Symphony Orchestra. So I can really live what that must have been like. Of course, the piano concerto had a heck of a lot more notes in it, but uh, the London Symphony is truly a marvelous orchestra and has been through all the years. So, you know, the systematic musical education in Russia, starting with the foundation of the Moscow Imperial Conservatory. That's where Rachmaninoff starts studying at 14. And the school expanded into the general music 
during the Soviet era, which was a whole expansive era in Russia. You know, a kid's education started when they could reach the keys. Now, we don't really have that now. We don't have that kind of education. So you have 40 years of special school, and then at the age 15, they go to a music college for three years. And then finally, they enroll in the conservatory. And by that age, by around the age of 16, these young pianists and composers were not encumbered by any technical boundaries. In other words, if they could think of it, they could play it. There was no technical boundaries at all. We're trying to become master composers. All of us, uh, you know, we, we want to get as good as we can. But we don't have that kind of state-run educational system that really demands diligent work from the time you're three years old all the way up until you're 21 or so. So what does that mean? You know, technical boundaries. You don't have any technical boundaries. Prokofiev was one of those people did not have any technical boundaries. And that's why you can hear the gymnastic piano passages that takes people like Lang Lang to perform. And that's the first performance I heard was with Lang Lang, the famous pianist. So we have to ask ourselves a few questions before we dive into the actual notes here. What happens uh, when you have no technical boundaries? Well, what happens is you become an artist and composer instead of a player. But since we don't have this type of training, we're going to become composers who play decently, but we use technology. This is our era. This is the time for us. We are going to take everything to another level. And even these great people, when we get into analyzing them, as much as you could love Prokofiev, and everybody that knows me knows I'm a big fan, when you really analyze their stuff and you do it with me, you will have some very interesting discoveries, which we will see today. If you have freedom from technical boundaries. What are you lacking? Let's say a pianist today happens to grow up in Beverly Hills, California. His mother and father were doctors. They gave him the best musical education. He started when he was three playing little uh, Herbie. He started when he was three years old playing the violin. He knows all of the great literature for the violin, and now he's going to become a composer. What happens? Well, Today, with the type of music theory, he's going to need to have music interval theory because this is really the next way to look at music. So what we have to do as composers in training, and I think Frank will agree with me, we are both composers in training. We both feel like we have a long way to go. You can be a master composer and still be a composer in training. Our job is to make ourselves aware of all the technical boundaries of the instruments. And when I say the instruments, in our case, we're going to be talking about the piano. And since we're not concert pianists, we need to make ourselves aware of it. And so how do we do that? We have to listen to great instrumentalists. We have to have techniques that we develop. And we have to do things like we're doing today, which is analyzing some of the truly great pianists and the ones that have written piano concertos. We're starting with Prokofiev. This is the piano concerto number three, his most famous one. We're going to go from number one to number 12 in the main score. So if you have your scores, what you want to do is just kind of take a look where number one and number 12 is. Number 12 is the statement of a new theme. And so we're going to get up to that in the next part Part two will start on number 12, and it'll go through number 28. So you can be prepared for the the next one. This is going to be the introduction, just kind of a roadmap of how we will approach studying and what we'll do with it once we have studied a composer. Prokofiev, Piano Concerto number three. This is the first part. And so we're going to look at this and listen to some of the pieces. This little clarinet, this is the first, what I'm just saying, a first fragment of the theme. And here's another fragment from the Mita. 
perspective. This first theme, I, I'm looking at this whole piano concerto as a giant place for me to gather material. Why else would we study other composers' material if we weren't looking for places to gather? So I just want to go through the process. If you think in terms of this analysis is showing you how to look at any music, even your own, and gather material from it. Because, you know, the process is gathering the material. We got to know where to gather it from. You gather the material, then you make sketches, you develop your sketches, then you do a development and orchestration. There's a process that is a proven process. So this is to help you understand how you can actually apply all this, all these different parts of our process. So the first thing I did is take this fragment of the theme and put it into a vertical structure, which is right here, and it ends up being two plus one plus four. And I looked at that theme and said, okay, this theme has some strong intervals in it, and that's part of what I like. And these guys, if you look at these and you total them up, it's got a strong interval in it, because if you total these up, there's a seven. And so sevens always make strong intervals because they occur at the lower end of the overtone series. So you see the second part of his little fragment of this theme, I did the same thing. I took all the notes and put them over here. And the only one outside of it is this little G. And other than that, it's the same as this part, the first fragment. So we have two plus one plus four, and this is outside of this. And the interesting reason why you can say, well, it's a big deal. Well, we're going to do some, some fun stuff with this in, when we start applying PC to these guys. And we're uh, gathering materials. So you can hear these chord changes now. These I'm calling them chords because they're vertical. Okay, so you can hear those, those are the basic formulas that we're using two plus one plus four. And this is the PC of that. If I took this guy right here, starting on D, and I put three plus four, three plus four, three plus four, what I end up with are all the church mode notes in the key or tonal center of C. We go D, F, A, Next one's going to be the C, then the E, which is down here, then the G, then the B. That's all of the church modes. That's this one here. This represents seven tones. This is the formula for all the church modes. The more you think about this, the more you're going to realize how powerful it is. Okay, so what happens is that we have this beautiful clarinet that's opening up this. And so I, I really want everybody to focus on the quality of the clarinet when it's written high like this in a very nice, beautiful range. And how it becomes a little more morose when you get down in here and it gets a little sadder. So you can hear... Okay, and this is just simply all scale until we have a simple chromatic alteration. here. And these tempos that I'm playing this in are not exactly right. We can slow them down just a little bit. The idea is how do you use chromatic alteration? This is the perfect example of how you would use it to create the whole phrase. And, you know, when you just listen to the music, this is how it's orchestrated. The second clarinet is actually playing these guys. And you want to see what's going on when they get this high together. It's a beautiful sound. You'll notice here there's a rest in the opening of this theme in the score. When the orchestra comes in right here at number one, and this is an open voicing underneath. And these are the COPs. If we closed this voicing up, and you do that by doing that type of a thing. I'm keeping it down for right now. But if you close this voicing, you get these sort of sounds. 
And these aren't actually in the score, but I leave them in here so you could hear what it would sound like using PC in closed harmony against this melody. So it'll come from the clarinets just playing from here. I want to keep it slow enough so we can hear. This is actually where the tempo gets much brighter. Let's go back up to here, though. You see this little section here? This is little free line modal writing. That's all it is. Writing the theme and then a free line modal writing. What I like about it is if you'll notice, Prokofiev is avoiding doubling really in here. Like that's one of the things we try not to do. We try to avoid double. And this is a bassoon that plays this guy in here and gives you this little line, which is a really nice color because it's a double reed instrument. And coming out of the clarinet, which is round and all that sort of stuff, it's a very nice intro to this very fast section. It adds a little tension because of the texture of the sound. I really like the way it leads into this. So you can hear, let me speed this up just a little bit down here. Let's look at number two here just as an analysis. You know, a lot of times when you're a writer, how do these guys write these long lines and cover bars and bars and bars and they don't run out of range? Well, this is what Prokofiev did and that's why I have it marked. You see how these guys are going up scale-wise and then he kind of sets the trajectory because he wants to land on, a, on the D here. So it it gives you that feeling. But to come back down, he's using chord tones, and he's skipping the guy that he started on. So every time he wants to get back down to make this line a little bit longer, he is using chord tones, skipping scale steps to get down. And there's a pattern to the way he does it. It's usually on beat two and four, beat two and then four. There's a form to this line. It's not just random notes and random writing. There's actually a thought process that went into this and it takes you beautifully into where he wants to go. So I'll just play this. Okay, so this, this is a great example of how you add a little extra note at the end of your line to make the statement that you're coming to some new place. So you just put a little flare right at the end of your line. This could have easily been orchestrated just keeping the same tempo, but this is you want to add a little bit of flare here, and that gets you someplace. And, of course, this is just a giant pedal tone all over C, and not a lot of RCs going on with Prokofiev's writing, at least in this first section. Later on, he does a little bit of the RC or RPs. But notice how he's got this so well orchestrated that when this hits, he leaves a break. A lot of the guys write, and as soon as they get to this section, they're writing right on this note. Leave a little break in your orchestration. So this gives the piano a nice clean entrance. So this is the piano playing this, so I'm going to play it from letter D here. Okay, so I'm just going to look at this. You know, we have a rule, no doubling and no outsides. Well, this is, should make you feel good because Prokofiev writes outsides. <laughs> he writes 13s a lot. He also doubles a lot. 
And so we have to ask ourselves a question. Maybe we need more to the 13 rule. And when can we suspend it? And should we suspend it? And does it sound better? If you see this counter line here, you see he's got an F and he's got a G flat here, clearly a 13. Would that have sounded better if he would have avoided that? How hard would it have been? I mean, he could have easily done that and avoided it. And if you play it, you can listen and just say, Okay, now I'll put it back, and you can take a listen. You actually do hear the 13, and this is not played as fast as it is in, in the piece, but just because something's fast doesn't really mean you can architecturally take liberties. Maybe you hear the 13 now. The same goes for the doubling. This is the piano, and so there's no need to double. You got a double here, then you got a one right after that, which is going to be completely opposite of these guys, but it goes by fast. So what I've done is I've gone through and I said, okay, if I'm going to be such a wise guy about don't double, and that, let's really look at this. And I spent time going through these, and I don't want to say fix them, but just apply our rules. And I would say half the time at least, it sounds better. And in an orchestral situation, it's not even going to be as obvious. So is it acceptable? Absolutely. This is a famous piano concerto. But Prokofiev wrote 13s. He just did. And here's another example of uh, stuff that... And then... A lot of stuff that in these guys where they're writing things because they're pianists. And if you're coming from the standpoint of maybe not so technical, this is a benefit for us because we can think about our lines. And if I want to conclude with this little pointing out of the section, you can write 13s if you want. We always say write it or write doubles, but mark it so you know that you did it. What that tells me and what it tells uh, the other instructors, Mita instructors, is that you knew you did it. Because oftentimes, you don't recognize when you're writing that you did that. So now this goes to basically the key of E flat minor. This is a, a big E flat minor time. And then it goes over, he puts uh, an A flat. So they got the bass continued to pedal doing this type of rhythm with these new roots, which you'll be able to see in your PDF. Okay, so it, he explodes from this guy. I'll play it from this guy to that. There we go. In the orchestration, actually, it was interesting to me because it just looked like this guy stopped playing. I usually like to say, you know, at least finish the line. So they could both go to that, that guy. But also, you know, we see more outsides here. And they continue, as you can see that we've got a lot, lot of stuff that's clashing in these chords that are moving up. These guys are pretty straight ahead. If you analyze these guys, this is an E flat minor. This is actually an E major chord. We're using flats to keep you all uh, alert. Okay, so this is E flat minor, E major, E flat. These are PCs of each guy in two like that, going all the way up, all the way up to here. So these are all just PCs, and that's a very interesting thing. So now you know. That's a very pianistic move. That's a perfect demonstration of pairing of PCs, and you can use this all the time. The interesting thing is that he's pedaling this bass over with all this stuff going on. So how do you analyze this? Do I analyze this with this being the root, the G flat and the D flat? Because it's bump, bump, bump. Basically, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still the pedal momentum going. 
And I think the best way for us to do this is in terms of the sections and what is going on. And so this is all triad thinking. And as you know, we have a saying, triads are the final frontier. Well, this is really proof because when you pedal, you can almost put anything over a pedal and it's going to be fine. When you pedal, doesn't really matter. If I'm pedaling any note, it doesn't really matter with a pedal. In this case, he's using a G flat. So if you really wanted to be classically oriented, you might say, well, yeah, but this is like a G flat major sound with the, with the E flat. That's just the sixth. But these are all triads. So you see this triadal stuff, it just keeps coming back. And he's got some strong beats with 13s on them between these guys. And I think it's important for you to recognize that if you write 13s, no one's going to criticize you for it because everybody does it. Bach does it in a lot of his inventions. They're across the parts and there's 13s. 13s are part of accepted sound. There are ways to make it better. And so what I wanted to do is just take a couple of these things and give you a view of this. So when you're actually analyzing scores, expect to see 13s. You're going to see them and recognize them as such. And then you'll start hearing them. And when you start hearing them, they bug you. You know, if you don't hear them, they don't bug you. When you do hear them, they start bugging you. And it's more of an overall smoothness. It's subtle when you got this much music coming at you, you don't really hear them. So here, for an example, this line, you know, it's going to end. And this is the voicing down here. And now it's going to be a D pedal in the bass. So I've got this guy down here and these guys landing here. Sorry about that. Okay, so I've got that against this guy. And so to me, what I see, this is a pianist that wrote this piece. This is an indication that we are the luckiest people on the planet to be studying music right now. We are also very lucky that we're able to look at things with a methodical, intervallic point of view. It's the way we're organized in MENA is a, a little different. We embrace both musical systems. We're all musical systems. Uh, interval theory is just how the intervals work. I mean, you could have changed this note and got just as much of an effect if you want it here. You're not going to notice this. You don't, you don't really notice it in the orchestration until it's pointed out. Okay, and hopefully uh, all those that participate will have these materials. So you'll be able to go through, look at it, and then find it in the score and really listen. This will fine tune your ears. So we've got a few of these guys going on. I just marked some red. We don't have to dwell on all of this because we have a lot of material to cover. But I wanted you to sort of see that Prokofiev, one of the great Russian composers, writes 13s. So that's the next little section. We're on four. I give you some possible fixes. All right. These are for you to go through and, and experiment with so that you would actually say, okay, here's Prokofiev who wrote this. Let me see for myself. Okay. Nobody wants to dictate to any of our CITs. What we want to do is just get you to be able to figure things out yourself and point stuff out along the way. Okay. So uh, this guy had some 13s going on in it because these guys are way up there. And I just took the liberty of changing this guy here. This was a C and I, I changed it only, only because it created such a, a harsh sound in the piano against the orchestra. And I thought, well, could this be better? It's not really a 13 until you get over, but it gave the sound because these are 8V. They're octaves, right? So this is the sound with the fixes. And this is the sound with no fixes here. I know, I know it's hard to hear. 
but I hear like a little bit of a poke every time this comes through. Now, if you like the poke, then keep it. If you don't like the poke, you know how to fix it. That's the point. It's no right or wrong other than this is why you're getting the poke. It's, we've got these ones happening, and it gives you a, a little bit of a 13 sound because you have octaves and stuff going on. This brings us to the end of the section five, which is this big piano run here. And these are the chord triads that this is based on. This is not in the score. This is just a run in the piano. It goes all the way. This is what it's based on. And what I liked about this is these are four, interval four. So this is a G and this is a B major triad and then going to a G. Now this is voice leading here. And then he uses a four plus four to connect these guys. Now these guys come down in this great little manner here. And I thought I'd highlight this. This is an octave down, of course. So there's a nice little continuity to the what I call the lead line. These are the chords, so you can hear how it sounds all together. So... This is a, a perfect example of how to write runs using triads. You put some triads together. And the way he just did this, he starts on five, three, one, five, three, one, and then jumps up. I just think this is marvelous the way he's done this. And this is going to the four plus four, the equivalent here. And so this is a great way to mix it up instead of just repeating the same thing. You take a couple of triads, go through them, add an equivalent that takes you into the next group. And it's a way to write interesting runs. It's not the only way. It's a technique on writing intervolic runs. This is a repetition of the theme, but with the orchestra playing it this time. Okay, so we got all these beautiful things. Now, let's look at. This is the new theme, or the new statement of it. This is obviously not written for the piano. This is the orchestra coming in. Notice he uses these nice little rests to bring in this guy, and this rest to bring in this guy. So it's very, very well done when it comes to that. He uses a lot of seven intervals. And in this run, I want you to see this pattern. It, here's seven, eight, seven, seven, eight, seven, seven, eight. Okay, and it actually starts with a seven here. So it'd be a seven, seven, eight, seven, seven, eight, seven, seven, eight. Whenever you have a seven, you know the root's the bottom, right? So this is some kind of a B. When you have an eight, you know the root is not the bottom. I look at this as an eight, and on eights, a lot of times the root is the top. Okay, seven's the root's the bottom, eight's the root is the top. If this is the top, then I'm going to look at this as in some kind of an E. If it's some kind of an E, then it's going to be a Lydian sort of sound because of this guy, right? And now we're seven again, so this is a G. So we have B, C sharp, or an E, and then a G. These are triads again. These are all based on little triads. And these are intervals. This sequence of the open intervals is a very nice way to make a point to these kind of lines where they are trying to get you into a new zone uh, range-wise. Okay. 
Okay, and it gets us very nicely into this new C tonality. All right, and once again, these marks here are showing either doublings or where there's some kind of rubs going on. But this little X means we're really looking at crossing of the parts. And this is a great way to write these type of things. You take your theme and you write your little theme. And now uh, you notice how these guys are repeating to there. Right? And so these guys are really crossing. Form and a technique is the point here that if you know these forms and these techniques, you can write linking passages to your works. Okay, so this line takes us into this, which is a new tonality, but restatement of the themes and kind of stuff that we had before. So we we're just sort of shifting and taking ideas from our gathered materials and going to a new tonal center. Okay, so you can see he's pulled from his ideas now. He's written some so he can regurgitate some of these ideas. And so these are the triads and the root lines of these guys. This stuff here is not included in the score. This is deduced from these guys right here. This has an E-flat root, but you know what? The thing is, up here, there's no third until you get to here, or that's a minus three, but there's no third at all. So you really get the C, even though this is an E flat, this is very subtly, you're subtly aware of this in the score because it's really basically no defining part because whenever you have a seven and these guys, you know, are sevens, this isn't a defining in a triad. The defining tone is the third generally, is a major, minor, whatever. So this is just turning our intervals around from the original theme using sevens instead of four. The original theme used fours. The PC is, I'm sorry, fives. The PC is uh, seven of five. So the original little fragments had fours in them. Now we have fives. So fours and fives, he's basing a lot of his motifs all on that. And as you can see, this theme goes into this little piano run again, which is some gymnastics for the keyboard player. Now you hear this guy playing over and over and on hard beats, sometimes you're hearing outside. And when you start hearing those, this is a pedal you can write almost anything against because there's so much inertial force. Okay, there's just a lot of inertial force. And so that's why this is acceptable. But when you listen to this and you hear this guy, okay, this guy is, is, is going to clash against that guy. He just is. And it's a strong beat. So if I play this now, you can hear it. I hope you heard it. <laughs> And so that's going to take us to eight, number eight. We're on number eight now. So this is another triadal movement that he's doing. And you'll see this guy. What is this chord here? It's a B minor, right? Going to a D flat. There's a PC. There's a PC, double PC. So he likes to put two chords together and PC him and have them jump around, but it's in form, okay? So if you see how these guys are moving up and then they jump around a little bit, then they move up, they jump around a little bit, but it's all PCs against this pedal guy that comes in again. And this pedal guy, why is he acceptable to the ear? Well, because you've heard him before. You hear him and, and he keeps 
inert, inertial force going. But to me, it's very strange to see, look what's going on down here. We're landing on G, and then we got an F sharp up here, and then we got Fs here. Okay, so this is definitely going to be interesting when you're sketching. If you had this in a sketch, you're listening to it, and you're going, well, I don't know. Why is this acceptable? Because beside this pedal tone, you have a ground motif that is a pedal tone, and this is a six going back and forth, completely unabashedly independent from what this is. This is just to keep stuff going. Analyzing this, okay, now we're getting a little bit of almost like I'm just playing sectionally, and as long as the section is strong, I'm not worried about the 13s that occur between sections. Okay, that's one explanation. The other explanation is they don't have a 13 rule, so 13s are okay. That means that we need to decide if we like it. Like this pedal, maybe there's another tone that could have pedal that didn't cause that, or maybe we change something, compensate a little bit on this guy right when this guy comes in. Like maybe it could have been this. Could have been something as simple as that to compensate. And so now you have... And I doubt if anybody heard this note change. I really doubt if anybody heard that, but it was actually this guy before. Right? But you're hearing this guy. So do you really need to hear that, that sound in there? Okay, my only explanation of saying, yes, I need to hear that sound in there was, yeah, but it's going to repeat. I'm going to keep hearing that sound in there. However, here, I'm F sharp. Now I got an F on hard, hard beat. This is just to point out, it's not wrong. It's just the way Mita looks at things. I'm not telling you not to write it. I'm telling you, if you hear something that is bothering you, it's probably that. That is really the extent of our rule. In the beginning, we want you to avoid them. When you're going through our course, we want you to avoid them. And the reason why is it's the one interval people aren't really trained to hear in a big orchestral setting. So we want you to focus on it because it's the interval that has not gotten a lot of attention in many eras of music history. Okay, so these are the chord changes. If I just look at the triads, what's going on against this guy. And you can see this is a section almost to itself. He's just writing these, and then he's going to write this against it. And it's going to be whatever he decides he wants it to be, but the sections itself will hold together. As you see, if I just play this, okay. Sounds like I made a couple of corrections there. And if I just play this guy. So these chromatic lines, you can write chromaticism. It's almost like our lessons on the bass. When we told you forget about 13th, when you're writing bass, you're just going to write your bass lines. And if 13th will occur, depending on the mode or whatever you're using, or if you're using just intervallic writing but there's so much inertial force. This is a giant sweep down that's going to get us into a new tonality right here. And this guy, we've already heard him, so that this is all familiar stuff. This is the basis of the harmonic content because you can see we've got this six going on, six going on here, six, six. Now it's going to go to sevens and fives. Okay, so let's just let this play. Okay, so see, you got this stuff just repeating itself. I decided just to compensate and use a different leading tone for these guys because these guys are going into this guy, see? I've changed this. So in the score, you're going to find that this has changed. So you can challenge yourself to find that. See how this guy, 
moves into this guy by one. This guy I changed as well, okay? This, this guy was a D sharp who was moving in to that guy by one. I changed him just because I thought I'd be fancy pants and see if anybody can find these. But this has changed for a reason. This is what everybody's going in to their guy by one, okay? So he's going in by one, and this guy's going in by, by one. Okay, and I, I thought, well, coming out of these triads, this would be a smoother line and would be probably more fun to play for the guys that are playing this, which would be the keyboard player. <laughs> Okay, so that brings us to nine, which is now going to be these big kind of hammering sort of percussion. If you look at this, it's a, it's a four, three, four. It's like a major seventh if you want to be diatonic about it. And then it's a D minor. But I look at this as a four, three, four. And then down here, this actually is got a whole bunch of 13-ish sounds against this, but they're working rhythmically together, and it really holds together as a piece. And if you play this, these each individually, you can kind of hear this pattern. So to me, that works because even though there's nothing but outsides everywhere in this section. It works very well because they're answering each other. Here's the original that makes the statement. That's what the pianist is going to play, and then everybody plays this. Okay, so that brings us to 10. If you're going to write a piano concerto, that's a great thing to do in sections like that. Uh, it's sort of a heightened experience visually as well when you see the orchestra and the pianist answering one another instead of just taking over in a section. And then this piece is, by the way, noted for the orchestra not being subsidiary to the piano, that the orchestra and the piano are pretty equal partners in all of this, so. Okay, so now at letter 10, we have some interesting stuff going on. It's really a split. This is all split type harmonies. So you got B flats and E naturals, triads. And you can say that this was octatonic, except when you start considering the bass. Analyze these according to sections, because otherwise you just drive yourself nuts and it won't be usable to you. So here we have another sort of bass motif. It's kind of going, and he's using these guys. Actually, if this one would all be octatonic, I would have G natural and a flat and not G flat here. This would put it in the octatonic so, sort of feeling here. But this section, if you listen to just this. Okay, so you can hear that's just those two chords, and it's definitely poly. They're six away from one and one another. And when you start adding all these other lines, it becomes pretty energetic. Okay, so now I just played that section. I, I realize it's all coming from just a piano sound, but you can sort of understand why the first critique, they said they made statements of some of Prokofiev's second piano concerto. It's like cats on the roof <laughs> can make better music. You can understand where the uneducated ear might hear that as just this wallet 
cacophonous sound. This brings me to the point, why write a piano concerto? <laughs> because your, your audience is going to be like this big of a box, you know. And if you are going to write a piano concerto, why? It's basically the reason to write a piano concerto. There are no boundaries, no technical boundaries of the player. It's really to present a player. And so one of your goals is to present the player, give them some gymnastics to perform, because it's actually a show. I mean, a piano concerto is a piano show. You know, that's why you get these guys that pound and stuff. It's a show. And so you have to understand, it's not about just about you. You want the pianist to have something that they can really be demonstrative on. But what it also does, it really gives you a lot of insight into the instrument. So if you want to write for the piano, you study these concertos, you will understand what the technical boundaries are or are not of these great players. So take a little breath here. So this is a continued all the way down. That's how these triads are being used. And they are basically just being outlined by these lines here. And I think there's an attempt made to make sure the tones picked here are the tones that are in the triads. So really what's creating all of the tension is this guy down here. This is a lot of the tension. So then this, I'm going to just get into this section into bar 61 of the, uh, for a little sketch here. Okay, that's going to get us all the way to number 12. So these little guys here are very interesting. If you take some time and just look what's going on here. G, A, D, E. This is a simple progression. And if I look at these notes... They're kind of mirroring the opening theme intervals. It's kind of interesting, which is pretty straight ahead, but there's a spacing. The thing that's odd for me is how all this stuff is just completely separated, or not completely, but really like sectional writing. So there is no one tonality, and it's not really polyphonic. It's what we call mixed tonality. Mixed tonality is different than polyphonic writing, and polyphonic writing is a system. It's a, it's a whole system of putting tonal centers together. Free tonal writing is what I would say some of this stuff is. It's not necessarily coming from a system. It's sectionally, because this section, I mean, this, this is really very pleasant and easy to hear. And It's pretty straight ahead, but then he chooses to put this e, e flat under it. And of course, you know, this E flat is pretty strong. He's pounding it, and there's E naturals. This is another pedal, and you can put anything against a pedal, but it's a definite kind of a sound. All right, and then you add all of these runs, which are going to be interesting because let's see what happens here. These, these are all the lead notes, which I think are, it's just kind of random all, all over the place. Um, but it sounds good because it all starts on E flat. Okay, and this, this gets us to this run which is just an E-flat scale. This is a chromatic alteration, another great use of it. And then chromatic. Most of the ideas in up from 1 to 12 are triadic, a lot of relationship of fours, so like a B major and a G major chord, and then 
using four intervals to connect them or triads that are just partial triads underneath your string lines and that sort of stuff. We'll now look at some meta applications using this concerto as a source for, this is very important. I really want you to take a moment and think, all this music, it's a source for gathering your materials. We have a tendency to think we have to find our materials and create the fertile ground of the crop of gathering materials. Actually, with what you're learning with intervals, you can go to any source and grab it and make it your own. That is why we say it's a source for gathering materials. And sometimes you do that out of necessity because you might have a film project and somebody says, you know what? I want you to write a, like Randy Newman. Well, you're gonna have to analyze some Randy Newman stuff. It's gonna be your writing, but you'll be influenced by Randy Newman. We're gonna look at the very first bar, which has two plus one plus four. And that comes from the first four notes of the opening. And the vertical structure, that vertical structure comes from three, four, three, four, three, four. This is a church modes, all the church modes. And this is a little explanation that you can read about what's going on with all those church modes, why it's important and kind of what the relationship is of doing this sort of thing. So when you PC, two plus one plus four, these are what you get. And of course, the reason why we do this, it makes it easy to check our work once we've got stuff written, especially when it's sectional, it makes it easy, easy to see. And at this point, if we have these guys, we can voice lead free of any specific root tones because as long as the root tone is moving in one direction or the other, so if my root tone, no matter which root I picked, was moving down and I wanted to voice lead, I would go from this one up. Regardless of what their lead tone is, I could build these from below. We'll look at this in a minute. If my root tones are going up, I would read these down, so I'd read this way, be the opposite. Just kind of like the way you read with voice leading symbols, you read opposite direction of the root. So we took this first. This is the application of gathered materials. So I took the very first four notes, and that's what I get out of the first of the four notes. By the way, if I go all the way to the beginning of this and show you, these four notes are the same as these four notes with the exception of the G. It's the same thing. That's why it's a two plus one plus four. This is in the matrix of intervals, and we have ways for you to use this interval combination, two plus one plus four. There's a lot of ways, ways to use it. So these are the PCs. So this is the, this is the root. All right, and I just add another root. This is an extended root from this. And I just open harmony here. So what you might want to do is look at open harmony. Sometimes open harmony opens the possibility to having a 13, but because especially if there's just a one between the notes, when you have open harmony, you're bigger than an octave generally. Like these guys are bigger than an octave, so you got chances of having 13s in there. And that would be, for an example, here. If I took this note and moved it down, now I have a 13, so I probably wouldn't choose that, but some of you would choose it. So this is just taking these guys, all of the same structure, but I'm looking at these and saying, oh, well, I really don't want to have against this. I don't want any doublings or anything like that, so I'm going to use the substitute tones. And I think this is kind of fun because for the C, I'm using a D, and then for the D, I'm using an E. So there used to be a C and a D in here, or and D for the E. So this guy was here, right? And that would have given me this. So I'm substituting. After this guy plays, I can pick him up, okay? So I didn't want to double, so I, I substituted for the C, for this D, and a D, for this E, that's what it would have been. 
So you got a double substitute tone going on there because I wanted this nice counter thing going against this theme. Close harmony, open harmony, and I get this now. Okay, so I'm going to slow down everything. I took this guy and just put voice leading to him over, this is RC4. I took these guys and applied these voicings over an RC4. This was the gathering of materials. I just want to see how this sounds. And so if I look at my first structure, which is, this is open harmony, so we're going to start here. This is a two, one, four. So I'm going to go, since my roots are ascending, I'm going to read backwards. So I'm going to go from here to this one. I want to read down because my roots are going up, opposite direction of my roots. So the next structure should be five, two, one. And sure enough, five, two, one. This structure should be the next one, should be four, five, two. I'm reading this way backwards because my roots are going up. So now this is going to be uh, that's a four, that's a four, five, two. And then the next one's going to be one, four, five. And so this is going to be one, or five. So that's where this bar came from. And so if I just played these by themselves without the roots, now it's, it's a little, little bit of hammery because it's all piano and not orchestrated, but that's what's happening. Then this is an RC3 right here. And so the same thing applied. Just put PC over the RC3. I just wanted to see how it was going to sound. And then this is an RC2. And I did the same thing, but now I open the harmonies. And I thought, well, when I orchestrate this, I'll open the harmonies up here, then go to close harmony. But I'll start close here and go open. So the piano might be open and the orchestra will be closed, vice versa. The piano will be closed and the orchestra will be open. Just orchestral ideas as I'm going. Now, th this stuff sounds harsh to me, but I still wanted to know how to use it. As a lot of the Prokofiev sounds harsh. I'm basically applying not the triadal type of the thing that Prokofiev was doing, but I am applying a vertical structure. It doesn't matter what the notes are in the vertical structure. You take those four notes, and I'll show you this in a minute, and you do the PCs, and those, those are the formulas you're going to use to voice lead those structures. They can be very consonant, or they can be extremely dissonant. These are a little dissonant because the vertical structure has a 1 in it. And then when that, that gets PC'd, we end up with some 13s, but certainly not as many as Prokofiev likes to write. So if I just, I'm just going to let this play, and you'll hear now a lot more theory in what we've gathered. Okay, so all of that came from the very first bar of Prokofiev's piece. Just looking at that structure, I just started throwing it around, doing PC. All these guys are nothing more than lines written around these guys. This, I picked the tones for this guy. I picked the tones that weren't in this. I tried not to double or land on them or create anything. Everything's coming from these guys, though. So you'll see that these, these notes are, this, this is the F, this is the D. They're not 
the F occurs over here. The D occurs over here. They're different. That keeps a consistency. So if I just play this without the chords, Okay, that is how I would take these guys. Just PC this guy, boom, put them over a bunch of different root cycles just to see what sounds good. And that's part of my gathered material. It's not the piece. It's not even the sketch. It's part of my gathered material. And it's a process. And so, like, if I go here and I say, we're going to continue at number 12, but for now I'm just going to look at this guy and do this quickly for you and show you how this works. So if I take C and I PC it, and I look at what the, what this is, this is four, three, this is three, five, five, four, and back to four, three, correct? So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna put these roots in. Just a two. Let's do it this other way. I, I actually want to go down. We get to the same place. <laughs> Just going the opposite way, as you notice. Okay, so this is two. Whatever this chord is, it can have any combination of notes. This is the next PC in the opposite direction. I just take him and transpose him down two. That's as far as I got to take it. And I get that's what it would be. And that's the proper voice leading. This is descending, and the five is going to go to one. From here to here is a four. So this, I would just simply take him down, because this is the voice leading, or the PC. I would just take him down four. Okay, and there we have it. Now five, one, three. Now we're going to end up on five again, because now this is a six, right? So, of course, this guy has to go down six. And as you can see, that's the proper voice leading. The reason why I'm demonstrating this is you can have the most complicated structure if it's within an octave and get all the PCs simply by taking the bottom note and putting it up an octave all the way through. It can be a six note structure or whatever, or do it the opposite way. And you can find your PCs quickly Okay, so this is basically a wrap-up of the very first part of analysis of the Prokofiev Piano Concerto Number 3. These series are designed to do two things. One, to get you very familiar with styles of other composers, because it's, we believe that it's an important thing. Uh, other people have put a tremendous amount of time in developing themselves. And if you can gain by analyzing them, you should as often as possible. And the second thing is for you to absolutely understand how the meta principles work and that they fit with any kind of music, any style. It's simply interval theory, and they're great, powerful tools for you to use. But like all tools, you have to use them to get good at it. So that's it for me today on this beginning of the course on Prokofiev. Hopefully by the time we're done, we will all be very familiar with Prokofiev, and that includes myself. So until the next time, thanks a lot for listening. So this is just a reduction. Make it real simple for everybody to absorb this material. And I just want to show you all this stuff we're going to go through today. But you see the rehearsal numbers. So this is all the rehearsal numbers. Just take you through it. And we're going to look at how he gets some of these orchestral techniques as well. And we go all the way to rehearsal number 25 here. And then <laughs> the end of part two analysis. But I want to show you the application of all the materials. And so the application will be in blue, but it'll be coordinated with the rehearsal numbers in the actual reduction of the score. 
And this is original material written on the techniques that were analyzed and extracted from the score. So hopefully what will happen is that you will get a little insight on how I extract and gather material from a big score. You can see it's quite a lot of material to go through today. So having said that, we'll kind of just spot check a couple things. And this will be available for you. So don't worry if we don't make it through today. So if we start from rehearsal number 12, there's some immediate observations. Here I tell you if we're using the upper range of the piano and then bass with all the grace notes, this gives you a pulse that is subservient to the quarter note triads. So of course we hear these guys are real prevalent. But these guys are really the face of what's going on. This is the playfulness that you hear. And it really sets you up for some cool sort of secondary pulses. So if I play this, you'll hear kind of how it goes now. So. Okay, so that's rehearsal letter 12. So you see how this is going back and forth in the orchestration. It's really a great little idea for you to keep in mind when you're writing. And he slowly brings it down until he's coming down to here. So it's a great use of dynamics. Of course, my tempos are going to be different today because I'm not interested in going through this real fast. I'd rather have you absorb it. So we go all the way over to here, and we're going to look at the application of this material. So here's the original. This is what he did. Okay, so we're going to start with this. And this is basically 3 plus 4. It's just a little minor chord, and then he's using 4 plus 4. But we can change the way this material will be used when we gather it by taking this first chord, moving the bottom note up and the top note down. And now we have an open voicing, and we're going to go to the closed voicing. So we find that we have room for little lines that are contrapuntal. And that gives us this sort of sound. So that's the first thing I extract. I said, well, what happens if I open the harmony? I don't want to take his just minor chord. I'm going to write my own piece. So these are some of the ideas. So we're gathering material. And then once I had this, I said, well, let me put a little line just on top of this. And of course, what am I doing in my line? I'm avoiding outside 13. So I'm avo trying to avoid too much doubling, all that sort of stuff. And so now you have this little guy. So that comes from that. Now, I go over here, and we know from our studies that 4 plus 4 has a very interesting quality to it. That's what he uses, right? That's his connector guy. That's his little portal guy. So we kind of want to keep that sort of sound. We like that. What we do is we look at the nature of 4 plus 4. And the nature of 4 plus 4 is any note in it, if you raise it, it becomes a minor chord. And any note in the triad, if you lower it, it becomes the relative major chord. So we have the relative minor to, and the relative major. And we have three of them because there's three different notes. So that's six different tonalities. So what I did is I said, well, let me just see what they sound like if I just put them all together going from every one of the possibilities because I'm gathering material. This is not my piece yet. This is just gathering. So now we get the sound.
So you see, it starts taking us through all kinds of possibilities. This will give us scale 11, and these roots are simply roots that I picked almost because they weren't really getting in the way of anybody else, and they had kind of a nice continuity to them. So I put these roots together with this, and we got a little bit more of a After doing that, I started looking at, all right, let's embellish a little bit because I'm gathering material. So we have this little part that we added. I didn't think this knocked me up because these guys were repeating, so I changed them here. Instead of two C's in a row and two C's in a row, I altered those. And when I altered them, this became more of an interesting part because I wasn't landing on the same note. And I put this little chromatic guy up here. And by the way, this piece is a great demonstration of chromatic theory. And chromatic theory is lightly touched upon in university. Chromatic theory, when it's combined with interval theory, is just marvelous. So I was testing the waters and wanting to see, well, what happens if I just add that sort of stuff? And so now, as you can hear, we start to have little inklings of a piece. I'm going to start it over here so you can hear. Now, what's starting to happen for me, of course, we're only hearing the piano. This is all the orchestra. So the piano guy, he'd just be playing this. Now we add a little theme, because that's enough of that. Let's see if I could add a little theme and see what we get. Put some offbeats down here. By the way, I mentioned scale number 11. That's every one of these roots. It would be the scale number 11 over that root. Now we have these guys, and let's let this play from here and go into this, where I'm going to... Just pick this melody from the vertical structures. That's all I'm doing. I'm looking at the notes, coming up with something from these vertical structures. So we'll play this. I don't want to dwell too long on just this one rehearsal number, but basically I'm using some little triple leading tones to kind of go into some of my guys because I wanted some more movement out of it. And at this point, we're tapped in to the creative pool. You've gathered material and stuff is popping into your head. So you don't need to have any more explanation than that. And what popped into my head is, well, I like two plus four because it's a triple leading tone into this. Everybody moves by one from this guy to this guy. And so I picked this guy and that's what's going on. It becomes a little triple leading tone. And so I added it into my pulse and put these roots underneath it on the offbeat. And this is all added last. I just added this because I wanted to get down into this stuff. So now you can hear this piece. Okay, so what about this? <laughs> this, you, you have to trust when you start pulling things out of these that you're going to come up with ideas. Sometimes the ideas will happen so fast and so many of them you can't even grab them all. This was a little bit of an experiment. Actually, when I do a piece on this material, this gets too busy too quick, I'll probably thin it out. But I'm starting to use some little 
techniques that I saw Prokofiev used in these type of little grace notes and things that in the orchestra are going to sound pretty cool and give you a nice added push on launching some of these new melodies. These are all going to be little themes that we'll visit for a while. So let's take it from here. Okay, so that was rehearsal letter 12. And we extracted material all from this rehearsal letter 12 from the red. There's so many little ideas. So we got these little guys. We open the harmonies. We realized that, well, if I want triple leading tones, two plus four moves into four plus four by one. Every voice moves by one, and it's contrapuntal. That's a really cool set of interval combinations to use. Everything, it was just taken from these little changes that we've got, a minor, major, seventh sounds, because that scale, scale 11, contains the four plus four. So 13 now is our next guy, and let's see what we get out of this. So I'm taking the idea of setting the pulse is a really fun way to make your sketch move forward. So I believe when you're sketching, you want there to be some of the real essence, which is pulse in this case. This is an acciatura sort of a thing, as opposed to a pagiatura. Pagiatura is where the accent is on the grace note, and the acciatura is where the actual tone is emphasized. So that's what Prokofiev uses. This is uh, acciatura here. And so I get a feeling now from some of this stuff. And what am I getting? I started visualizing because by this time we're in the creative pool. It's really starting to flow. That's such a great feeling. And as you know, as composers, once you're in that, there is no time. You can end up spending three hours and you realize, wow, that was a quick three hours. This is all designed to give you something to start. You want to have little techniques to start, get you going, because once you get going, it has its own life. Your composition starts just coming through you and you're going to have that creative pool connection that all of us want because it's the way we get stuff done and the way we get a million ideas. So I jot down my ideas. If I get the feeling of exodus with intention. It's, it's like Moses or something, you know, where there's an intention. We're going to find the promised land of composition here. And that's kind of the feeling I was getting. It isn't dark. It's just intent. Okay, so that's probably a lot to absorb. Well, I tell you here, at this point, I'm experiencing a flow directly from the creative pool. <laughs> and so you will not find these passages in the first movement. However, because I've listened to Prokofiev over and over and over, I hear things and I've analyzed a couple of deals. This is a lick. This is like if you're a guitar player, 
B.B. King. You're not ever going to be a, a blues guitar player if you don't listen to B.B. King. Well, these are all licks that he uses, and you start to see repeats. So I'm tapped into it. I'm pulling this little open to closed harmony here that we got from the very first thing and using it as a comping that I come back to. Why do we come back to it? Well, Frank Herlanger would say, we come back to things because they're familiar. And if you do that, you're going to have a successful piece because you don't want to just leave people with a million ideas and you're just off. It's okay. Come back and restate things. You can change it a little bit. I like to always change things a little bit, but you want to come back to familiar things. So here's a Prokofiev lick. So if you ever want a nice way to do this type of a thing, here it is for you. Just go ahead and look at it. And that's what you do. He's just writing these lines, boop, 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 up to the next note and then opening it up. See, there's a contour to the way it's done. Now, once I did this, I thought, well, what about roots? Eh, let me just see if an RC5 ascending and descending will double anything. And if it doesn't double anything, maybe that'll be a cool root line. Well, I just did that. <laughs> That's all it is. That wasn't any great genius. That was just me saying, hey, I want to have something happening in the orchestra. I don't want it to be overwhelming, so it'll be plucked. And here we go. Okay, so when we got here, we started to get lower and lower and lower. I put something high up here that references our little themes. This is really important for me to point out because if you listen to this, you could say, well, it sounds pretty good. But we're not writing the piece yet. This is all gathered material. If you stick with this Prokofiev series, which I hope you all do, at the end of all of our Prokofiev studies, we will end up writing a piano concerto based on all of the gathered materials that we have been doing. This is really what's going on for everybody. I want to make sure you're prepared. So when you get your Master Composer's Certificate, that you have been prepared to write your Master Thesis. This is something that no one in the world really does, except for the Russian conservatories. <laughs> and they're not even in existence the way they used to be. So. We want to establish that if you have a master composer certificate from Mita, you can write. And so this is all preparation. And you guys are in the jungle with machetes with us. We're carving a nice trail here. And it's going to be very intense, but so rewarding for all of you. Because when you go through this stuff, you start realizing, oh, I could write that. And I'm not afraid to take any kind of a job. Remember, these tempos and these ideas are 20 times more complicated than you need for any television job or any film job, really. Here, we're focusing on the music and how to write a piece and gather material and do sketches and development. It's like Stravinsky was asked to do a score, and he said, no, but only if you do your movie to my score. Well... I can totally understand why he would say that, because although film music is lucrative and we all want to do it, these studies are to set you up to be a master composer, which means you can do film, you can do ballet, you can do opera, you can do pieces that is going to last through generations. Some of you, if you're lucky enough to have that kind of success, and I think you will. So let's look at this stuff down here. We got this going on. I'm looking at the collection of notes that's going on and realizing I wanted something in the higher end of the orchestra, and I wanted it to make some kind of sense. And so I'm just taking from these guys and orchestrating up here between them and doing some leading tones and some PC. I keep the thirds are bouncing around here. I try to have some kind of a form in everything I do. So we go all the way through. Let's take it from the end of this little stuff. And 
back to our pulse. One, boom, two, boom. I hear that in the orchestra. It's just being this big exodus pulse that we would feel. And this is our little uh, close to open idea. Now, all of this stuff has a life of its own. It starts growing and starts becoming altered and morphing into other things. But the basics of the construction is the same. And that's what's going to happen to you. When you start getting into some of these techniques, you'll write a couple of things and then you'll be off at a movie theater or something like that. And you'll think, oh, what about that? Or you'll wake up at four in the morning thinking, man, I'm going to try something else. And those ideas that your receiver to take so much information in that you won't be able to stop it. When I put my repeats in, I am thinking I'm going to do it this way, but on the repeat. If the piano plays this, I'm going to have the orchestra do it on the repeat. So repeats to me are not, I just want to hear me play the same thing twice. It's part of my gathering materials. But I like this enough that I'm going to share the same idea with the orchestra. And they're going to talk to one another because this piece is all about both. They're pretty equal. It's not just the piano player. It's the orchestra and the piano player, and they're going back and forth. And so they're very close to being equal. I would say the piano has the visual in the performance because you got this pianist with his hands pounding on the keys, and that's the visual. But as far as the notes, it's a pretty balanced. Uh, okay, here's 14. This uh, We're looking at this vertically. And as I looked at it, I thought, you know, there's so many ways just to make this usable. But let's analyze it with chord symbols. I'm a guitar player as well, so <laughs> chord symbols are fun. What I notice is that, you see this? He voices this a lot. It's got a minus seven under here, so this is all okay. Because you could look at this as a big dominant with a flat nine and a four in it and a doubled root, which we wouldn't want to do that necessarily, but it's a sound for the piece. You can voice this a couple different ways. There is absolutely no reason why you couldn't voice this like this and this with all the same notes. Play this guy. Okay, so why would I make this change? First of all, you notice, if I do put this back, this is a very, I'll call it dissonant punch. So you do hear a little different sound. And the reason I point that out to you is I avoid those intervals unless they really make a lot of sense. This tells me that a piano player wrote this piece. When I see that, because piano players, they play 13s a lot. If this is a dominant, it's totally acceptable. But what I like if I do this, it sets up my octave for the rest of the phrase, whereas if I do this, it doesn't. So that's another reason why you would do it. These little guys, this is a great little trick because he's got octaves and then just counterpunt a line in between. Prokofiev uses that all the time. Down here, we have two plus one plus four. That's this guy, which is his little grace notes. The use of three plus three and four plus four with the inclusion of polytonal splits. And you'll see we have polytonal splits coming up in some of this stuff. Ends up being really interesting. He is a chromatic composer. So you see all these chromatic lines. Chromatic theory is something that is relatively easy for me to people. 
because of our vocabulary and our use of intervals and that, that sort of thing. So I'm going to play this guy here just so we can hear it. Okay, see how much this adds? When you're writing your piano part for your concerto, use this type of little acciatura and little grace notes here so that it really gives a playfulness to your piano and it's very pianistic and it adds a, a lot of spice to your piece. So that's 14. I extracted the basics from 14. And this is the basics. In doing that, I realized, wow, it's got a kind of a cool sound to it. And I'll play it for you. Okay, so I take that. If you look at these structures, you start realizing that there's kind of a form to them. This is taking this collection of notes that's just close and putting it through PC. Some of you might wonder when you get to the nature of series, why we only go through fives, five plus one, five plus two, five plus three, because it's, we start repeating ourselves. All the bigger numbers happen automatically with the others when you have PC. So we PC this. Remember, we're gathering materials. What did I tell you about repeats? I put repeats in when I think I'm going to want to hear something more than once, and I'm going to switch it in the orchestration. So that's what repeats mean to me. If they didn't mean that to me, I'd have a second ending here someplace. <laughs> so, and so now you can kind of get the idea of what these are. The creative pool is once again starting to flow for me. I wanted to start with a horizontal and vertical intervals that we extracted from the lead line. Okay, so this is the lead line. See those notes? That's where I got this structure. This looks like a fistful of marbles here. Then PC'd it. Okay? So now we're extracting from the PCs and all that sort of stuff. And I am going to play this. So you see, all from this, we're able to extract. We extract, gather material from just, I take these guys and say, okay, that's cool. Remember, you have a lot of lines. You have this line, which is this. You have this line. You have this line. Bunch of lines that you can extract, put them vertically put them through PC, and gather some materials. That's what I was doing. These, I simply looked at what was going on up here, and I opened like your bass lessons that you have. I'm just opening up the harmony and writing something nice. I wanted it to have a sound of the piece. This, I hear, wow, I can slow this down and make it more intent and end up with a very nice, slow kind of movement with a beautiful woodwind against it. This is all gathered materials. Doesn't mean we have to play them at the same time. Okay, here's our little lead line again. This time we're adding to it, putting something down here. I'm going a five to a three. Remember we, we started looking at fives and threes. Fives and threes, see? Three, where's the three, TC? There's the three, five. I'm thinking fives and threes, that's all. So I'm going to use fives and threes. So now we go back, let's come out of it here. Can 
you guess where I got this little idea from? Okay, it is from Prokofiev. <laughs> you know, you get older, you start forgetting where you got the ideas. This guy, he's on the lower note. I wanted to see, well, maybe I don't have to do this high note because that really brings it out. It has, it's very prevalent. I want it a little more subtle this time, but I, I want it. So I put it down here. And that ended up being a great little orchestration coloring that I discovered from switching this guy around. So here's our PC again uh, with these guys. And we're going to get into putting this over that and see what we get. Okay, so this part into the orchestra here, I, I like the way that sounds. And see, it was over here before. Now I can write a piano part because I'm visualizing my piano player. He's going to be up in front of everybody and the orchestra's playing it. I want to see those hands moving. Uh, so let's give him a nice little part. And he can take us into presenting himself here, which this is going to be little intervallic stuff that's just repetitive and you'll see how that sounds That's enough of that idea. So obviously this is an area that needs development, but I liked the contour of it. I think it could be shifted tonally, that type of stuff, but it gave me some good ideas. And look at this, here's the four plus two guy. We're bringing him back again. These are three plus three plus threes with just a little note going around. This is based on three plus three plus three. Chromatic alteration to avoid 13 in the piano. So I just altered this guy because I didn't want to hear that or that. So I was able to get out of the way. You don't hear this compensation. You feel it. You feel it. It feels smoother. If you don't want to be smooth, a smooth composer, then you don't need to compensate. All right, so I look at 16 here. 16 is a short. I don't care about these notes. You know what I care about on this? The orchestral rhythm against the piano rhythm. That's what I care about. I'm not even interested in these notes. I'll figure out my own notes. I make some little observations. This guy's moving by ones. Remember, he's a chromatic composer. He does a lot of chromatic composition. But I like these rhythms. I wanted to see, okay, how does this rhythm in the orchestra sound against sixteenths, where I got these sixteenth triplets and these eighth notes and stuff. So that's basically what I was interested in. This is all rhythms. I'm just playing the same note because I just want to know what the rhythms do. But what I discovered out of this gathering of material was, wow, you don't have to have a lot of notes. You can just repeat the same note. It becomes interesting music. Put repeats. We all know why Tom puts repeats and things. And I kept adding a part. So this is just this and this. And then I added this. And then we started adding other guys, this and this. And so you're going to start hearing what happens when you just put these rhythms together.
So I went back into his piano, Prokofiev's piano piece here, partly as a joke for you guys, just to show you can go from almost anything into any of his other pieces. But as you can hear, this becomes a little bit of an interesting rhythm. And remember, this could be much slower and it could be used in a bunch of different ways. But I liked the way this, this worked out. And by just keeping the same notes here, I realized this could be bounced back and forth. doesn't have to be a piano player. And you can create a very interesting comping effect for your themes and that sort of stuff to be against it. Okay, so that's, that's what we got from 16. Seventeen. The reason I put this here is because this is the point where I really want you to focus on all this stuff. That's why I have it marked in your piano writing when you write for the piano. I really want you to sit in the piano player's chair. I should do that for all the instruments, but piano, of course, has a lot of notes. How to actually distribute the handiwork of the keyboard player, you know, is an art form in itself, making sure that it's playable. Very complicated stuff can be played easily if you have the right usage of the hands. So 17, just as to point this stuff out, I'm showing you that certain things could be fixed. It would make better sense if this guy was setting up the octaves here to me. That's a personal decision. Whenever I see 13s voiced like this, uh, it reminds me of a keyboard player more than pure composition. So now what we're going to do is we're going to gather materials. This is from our opening stuff. Remember this thing? So I'm taking this now. This is from the one of the previous numbers, right? So we have that guy. And I'm looking at just the intervals between the bass and these different lines here. I'm trying to get this. This is... Because really, this is how, that's this lead line. I just put it in a sort of scale-wise fashion. And I realized, oh, this is 11 with 4 plus. That's good. I don't like voicing stuff that looks like grapes too much unless I want an effect. So I realized, let me put these guys down. And I realized, oh, it's just two sets of four. Oh, that's great. That even opens it up more to some fun things that I can put down here. Then we have the PCs of those, which makes it fun against that. And we can have fun with going back and forth with intervallic type thing. So now I'm gonna just write a little piece because the creative connection is telling me, hey man, write this little piece here. Pull from all the gathered material that you did and at this rehearsal number. And let's let's do this. little idea to be continued because I'm going to want to have more of a development of my theme when I actually am going to start doing my orchestral development. And so that's just little reminders of what I want to do. Rather than me going back and forth, I'm just going to try to go through this because we're almost at a point where you guys get a bird's eye view of what this whole series is going to be looking like. So this is covering those huge triplets that he did. And you can look at your rehearsal letters, but marked in red is the rhythm. Bop, 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 bop. Bop, 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 bop. Okay, that's the rhythm that you'll hear 
in the fully orchestrated piece. He changes the rhythm up. But how do you write this type of thing was my question. Uh, it seems like it's just chromatic. Oh, it's easy to do. Well, if you want to do this and you want to do it with rhythms and have control of where the rhythms are and figure out why, you have to have some kind of a little analysis. And so that's what I've done to give you a little assistance on being able to write these type of things. So when you really digest it, I put these structures on the heavy beats and the only thing I really cared about was this guy, these guys. These structures, in my mind, were only related to themselves, not to any of these notes. Like harmony and force, which is basically five plus five, that goes to two plus five, five plus five, two plus five. That's how I was thinking here. So I, I have a continuity in the type of harmony I'm using, even though it's only relating to the lead line. And of course, that's all I'm pun punching there. So I don't have to worry about these guys too much. That's the essence of this. If you go through this and analyze it and try to write a few of your own, you're going to be good at this. This is mostly chromatic writing, but there's a form to it. And you can put almost any intervals against this and fix the 13s after the fact. So it's pretty quick to do. We kept these little ideas that we took from the, the course. I'm combining them to see what they all sound like because really you want your piece to be drawing from itself. A piece of music is a living thing. It's like I can't go any place without my feet, you know? <laughs> I'm going to have my feet and my rear end with me no matter where I go. So that's what happens with these. These are all little parts of the body of the piece, and it's okay, you know, to look at your feet more than once a day. So it's okay to visit these guys more than once in a performance of a piece. Okay, at 21 in the red rehearsal number, it's this comping guy, and you'll recognize it, I'm sure. Okay, the reason why I put it two different ways of orchestrating it here so you can see, you notice no difference because it's piano playing it, right? This is like this because this is how a piano player would be able to play it comfortably. It's breaking up the hands. What is the essence of these lines? Well, here's the essence of the lines. That's the essence of it. You see? A, D, A, D, A, D, A, D. It's the essence of what's going on. Most of you aren't haven't had the lesson on string theory yet. String theory is when you take interval combination and another one, and you put them together. We just call that a string. It's pretty simple, but there's a lot of ways to use it. So we take this little string idea, then I PC it, put it all together, and PC it, so we get all these guys. So we're extracting material from this, is what's happening. These are Prokofiev's notes, and these are our gathering materials. We're starting to get ideas for string theory. Okay, so that's one sort of comping. We got pulled that line out of it. Okay, remember, chromatic theory, that's what we're doing. This is all based on chromatism, and so you start getting that sound. Actually, when you start using it and it's balanced with some nice releases, which Prokofiev does. His opening theme to, to this movement is just, just beautiful. 
coming out of this whole section, that's where he goes. So it's a really great release. So what I did is I took this idea rhythmically and started adding intervals to it, changing it, and you'll hear how it evolves. Okay, all you uh, powerful composers and guys that have been kind enough to spend this time with me, that's what you're going to get in this analysis of the Prokofiev series, how to write for the keyboard, how to combine theories. You can use chromatic theory. By the time we're done with Prokofiev, you will be very well trained in uh, chromatic writing, not just chromatic scales up and down, but actually very musical things, how to combine scales within that context, and orchestral grooves. My favorite TV and film composer of all time, rhythmically, was Jerry Goldsmith. He knew how to make the orchestra really groove. And so that's uh, one of the other things that we want to extract from this series, is really make the orchestra cook. That's so much fun. And believe me, the musicians get into it when there's a real cook in the orchestra. And part of me is doing this for my own education as well. I'm riding the, the receivership with you guys for the, the creative pool. You know, Frank and I are so dedicated to you guys because we consider you the heart of our company. And Mita wants to make sure that when we go out there to the workplace, we knock it out of the park. If you need help on something, don't hesitate to call. We'll try to help you. Okay, so that's the end of part two of the Prokofiev analysis of the third piano concerto, movement one. And so now you should be seeing the forehand piano. It's actually, I have it marked orchestral down here and piano. I've tried to keep them separated, but sometimes it's just notes that I'm taking on the piece. Before I actually jump into this, I want to let you know, Prokofiev had a very rocky start. You know, think of uh, he only lived to be 61. And during that time, he lived through two world wars. He started at the age of five. He was born in 1891. His mother took him to the conservatory, and he played and was accepted. And he spent the next four years getting highly trained. You can Google him. I suggest you Google his history a little bit, because it's very interesting. Some of us composers think we have a tough time. And it's a t it is a hard job, but nothing like these Russian composers had to go through with horrible weather, really bad health, a lot of them. Prokofiev's health in the last 10 years of his life was very bad. He lost a couple of wives, and out of that, his career seemed to flourish as he got into his older age. And here's one of the reasons what enabled him to flourish is that when we're artists and we're connected, and when I say connected, I mean to the creative pool 
we call it the CP. You're not living in time or in space. You're just in a beautiful, creative pool that you don't really worry about anything. You can forget about the bills you have to pay and that sort of thing. So we want to spend as much time in that space. Of course, we want to be responsible citizens, but we want to be in that space because that space, such magic happens. It occurred to both Frank and I that this was something we have worked on and we wanted to share it. So as we go through the Prokofiev, you realize what a tough time he had. So we're going to start with rehearsal letter 26. And uh, you can see this is first movement. And this is our part three. This is the piano. So I want you to make some observations. Number one, all of these notes, the whole way through this, if you look at it, just glance at it quickly, these first couple pages, it's all basically two scales. It's the Ionian and the harmonic major. We call those scales scale number one and scale number two. So he goes back and forth between these two scales, and it gives a great flavor. And composers like John Williams do the same type of thing. If you see some accidentals, like you can see these little accidentals over here, these are chromatic alterations. It's not part of the scale. The only thing you see is white notes here and one little flat here, which is scale two, the harmonic major. So this is the sound on just the keyboard. And you imagine he's, he's sitting there trying to do all this. Be very difficult, of course, because you can't do all these tremolos on the keyboard. We've done two types of analysis. One type is just the diatonic thinking. So if you're a diatonic thinker, you went to university and you studied all the composers and you studied figured bass and you studied what they call vertical structure theory. This is basically what's going on here. But also we start looking at the meta way, which is looking at what these structures have in them for intervals. And we start looking at both because if you can live in both worlds, it's just that much easier to analyze things. So you might not recognize a vertical structure, a chord, but you can easily recognize the distances between the notes. And so here, this is a perfect example. From the bottom up, we have three, three, four, four, three. That's what this sound is. This is not in the orchestration that you heard. This is just a note for me to look at. What are What is the collection, the body of notes that makes this sound? And so this is the sound. So you can hear that is the general sound. And then when we play the or orchestra and put the tremolo in there, that gives us this. Okay, 27 becomes a bit messy because this is just to show the notes and it's playing everything. And some of the tremolos are a little awkward, as you might guess. You know, I'm looking at coming to some conclusions here also because Prokofiev being a pianist without boundaries, what that means is he's gotten so good by the time he's in his teens that he could play anything that he could think of or hear things that myself and other composers, my contemporaries and associates would look at and go, oh my gosh, thank God for Sibelius and being able to program. We live in a perfect age, by the way, because we have all these technical tools. This can make up for lost time. If you're like me out there, I've worked very hard for a lot of years to get some of these techniques and understand them. It wasn't until I started looking at things from an intervolic basis that I could really understand and use everything. So I try to go through all this Prokofiev stuff so you can begin to do that. 
So if you look right here, this is a D minor seven flat five, okay? But it's expressed this way for me. And now I could start anywhere and build this structure because I, I know what that sound is. And I can also see partials of the sound by doing that. So when we go through this Prokofiev stuff, you're going to have two languages. One is going to be diatonic, and the other is going to be meta language, and that's an intervallic language. We don't advocate one or the other. We advocate the world of music, the pool of creativity. You do not have to forget what you've learned or change the way you think. It's an addition. Mita is an addition to what you know. And hopefully you will eventually become more and more comfortable with intervals. And you will see that it's a mind freeing. It's like being able to speak a bunch of languages and being comfortable in them. Twenty-eight. I'm just going to play. This is interesting because what you should notice are the not so obvious things. One of the things that's happening is we have these nice triplets in the left hand and pretty much straight eights and stuff in the right hand. And this is a wonderful sound. It's used a lot by Prokofiev, where he puts triplets against eights. If it's played the way he beautifully does, you get a kind of a floating feeling. So I'll just play this for you. Okay, so that tempo, of course, is way too fast, but I'm just showing you what is available here because we do not have enough time to really dwell on this. So you just need to know what's available and spend some of your own precious time really absorbing this. You know, all the notes are still white notes, as you notice. He's getting so much out of this one scale, and these are very simple chord changes. And also, there's some free line writing. But to me, the big thing, and you don't hear it here because this is why I had Frank play the rehearsal numbers. You need to hear the orchestra because this little theme is played in many ways, but only partially. And it's picked up like down here. It's picked up by the bassoon. And then it gets picked up again and again, so you keep hearing it, but they're partials of the theme. So when you're writing your larger performance pieces, or even television cues, really good TV music has partials of the theme that appear all the time. This is some of the things that we can learn. Also, listening to these rehearsal letters that I just played, if you really hone in on just the clarinet, you'll hear how beautiful the clarinet sounds in this range that he's put it in. It sort of has that very morose feeling that living through the time period that he lived through in the Soviet Union, where the artist was basically housed and fed and pumped full of knowledge every day by the greatest teachers that the Soviet Union had to offer. But it also created a very narrow path musically. A lot of those guys had huge egos and were very difficult. We believe it's better for you to not have that, to be very open. You're not in competition with the world here. You want to make sure what you do is work on yourself as a receiver of the creative ideas that are universal, eternal. You don't own them. You receive them. You realize them. That does not mean that you can't take a piece of music and go register it with ASCAP, of course. But as far as the creative space, you don't own that. You tune into it. It was more about just the strenuous life of, I've got to practice all day and do all this. 
But we are in a different age. We are in an age where our time is different than theirs. We can accomplish much more than, let's say, Mozart did. Although, you know how much he wrote? Amazing. But he died in his mid-30s. So we have time. We have technology. But we can't forget that we have the same spirit that they were born with. And we're going to concentrate a little bit on making sure we combine technique to get us to the creative path that takes us to this great body of energy and the pool. So in this section here, what we're doing is when you listen to the big score, I want you to listen to where this little partials of the theme come in and how beautifully it goes back and forth between the bassoon. Then down here, it's the clarinet. And this is such a beautiful place for the clarinet to play. And then the piano takes over and plays the theme. And so what is really a small piece of music becomes a very nice, beautifully orchestrated larger piece of music. So here, let's look at 29. 29 is still white notes. You see where we have CA marked here? That's just a chromatic alteration. You know, for those of you who don't use chromatic alteration, it is exactly what Prokofiev did to create this beautiful lifting feel at this rehearsal number. And even though my tempos are a little weird, at 29 here, I think, let's see what this sounds like. Uh, You hear how that little chromatic alteration gave him a little longer period to get up here? And of course, this tempo is really slowed down in the piece. And then he releases it with the piano. This is just great. And the orchestra goes into tremolo, and this is a swelling effect. At rehearsal number 30, this you should really learn because this will enable you to take the orchestra and swell it against a solo instrument. So let's notice what's going on here. First of all, we have these tremolo guys in the orchestra, and we have this line down here that is just going up almost like the scale, all right? This is just a line that moves up. It's a chromatic here. It's a chromatic scale against this tremolo. This is what we have in the orchestra. For those of you who are always confused by orchestration, stop the confusion. Let yourself embrace a few simple ideas and apply them. If you do them once or twice, it'll become part of your orchestration bag of tricks. This is what the piano does against us. And once again, we have a straight feel here in the orchestra. And triplets. See, he's got a triplet here and then straight eights and then triplets here. This is really great. And also the use of the piano, the breath. These are very high notes. And of course, the way Lang Lang plays this, it wouldn't matter how high the notes are, he would play them beautifully. So this is what it all sounds like. Okay, so when you go to rehearsal letter 30 in your big score, that's what's happening. Why does it swell? Well, the dynamics, for sure. You got dynamics. But the bass only lasts two beats. There is no bass on the last half. The piano goes up very high on the last half and it gets softer. Okay, so it's dynamics. The thinning of the orchestration on the back half of the bar it helps with that swelling effect. Also, you should never be afraid to use chromatic lines in an instrument. Here, the chromatic line is continued in the 
orchestra, but it's also in the piano. I mean, this is the piano part, just the left hand. Listen. Okay, so that adds to the swelling effect because he's not moving that fast here. When he gets here, the bass drops out. The dynamics go down. The piano gives a chromatic, and it goes up an octave. All those add to the elements of the swelling effect. So what you need to do is to actually write something, pick a couple of vertical structures, and try doing this type of thing just a couple of times, and you'll see these tricks are pretty accessible for those of us who want to put in a little bit of time. This is 31, and this is a cascading effect. It's great. Look at this chromatic line again. These numbers up here, this is meta language. This is the distance basically in chromatics. I'll explain it diatonically. So this is three half steps descending from here to here, then six up, then seven down. Okay, seven down, that's a fifth. So this is a pattern that just continues. This is a cascading effect. This is a great effect for falling or rising of emotion or jumping out of an airplane. I have little notes here for you. If you're doing an animated show, how many times you've seen animated characters fall on Wile E. Coyote or those type of things? You see animated characters fall all the time. So this is a quick way to get through that section so you can get not be hung up on writing a fall. These notes here are the vertical analysis of these. These aren't in Prokofiev's orchestrations. This is just analyzing, showing you what the vertical structure is. It's a three, a seven. So it's a minor third, a fifth, a minor third, a fifth, a minor third, a fifth, minor third, a fifth. That's what he's doing here. But he phrases it in triplets. And when he phrases it in triplets, it gives you a very smooth sort of pattern. The pattern is four notes. It's phrased in triplets. Now down here, if I want to see what notes these guys line up with, well, they line up with this one, with this one, with this one, right? And you start learning. Well, some of these notes, they doubled. He's not worried about, this is a chromatic line. Chromatic lines will stand out. They're like a tambourine. A tambourine you can hear no matter how loud the orchestra is. <laughs> Tell that percussionist to back off. That's what you're going to get out of this. You need to look at the rhythmic things, the vertical intervals. How he's doing tremolo. You know, the tremolo is very interesting how it gets used in the orchestra. In the piano, you've got to be careful when you're writing tremolo for piano. You've got to be enough of a pianist to know what is reachable, what isn't. This would be difficult in one hand. You could probably do it, but it's, this would be difficult. Now we go back to rehearsal 26, and we're going to do, look at quickly, an application. I can't just talk about what Prokofiev did. I have to do it myself. So this is what you should do, is you should do what I'm showing you now if you want to have these bags of tricks. So I went through and I analyzed all of the vertical structures, and I did it in meta terms, which are all of these different possibilities. This is almost like a little sketch. So you can hear what this little couple bar sketch is. I'm only going to play two bars here. Okay, so this is my little sketch. I just kind of wanted to put it all in a vertical structure. I'm still taking from scale one and scale two, which are the Ionian and the harmonic major. Most people really don't think of harmonic major much, but John Williams does. So if that is an enticement to you, maybe you should start thinking it. These two scales are what we call a great scale pairing. So I took some of the tremolos ideas 
and wrote a little melody and then just kind of composed a piece pulling from all of these different intervals adding chromatic alterations at times but it's basically just pulling from these couple of scales I tried to incorporate some of the stuff that we learned, put triplets against eights, tried changing up the stuff going back and forth between the two different scales and getting into some other scales because you're not stuck. You don't have to use the Ionian and the harmonic major scale, but that's the start. So as I got into it, I expanded. I was connected. I had taken Prokofiev's technique and I started writing and I realized, oh, but I want a little bit something different. And so the ideas started flowing. And when those ideas flow, you're basically beginning to connect and you're receiving from that huge pool out there of creativity. Here I decided to orchestrate. It's really a great way to orchestrate woodwinds where you have the close interval open, then close, open, close, open, close, open. It gives you a little different blanket of a feeling. Here again, triplets against eighths. So that's basically an introduction to the application. You really need to know what these numbers mean and what they could mean for you as options when you're orchestrating or even composing. This I would consider a sketch that would later be developed. So some of the keyboard parts would be orchestral, like these would probably be orchestral. These would be orchestral. Some of it would be piano. You hear the piano when it's released. Imagine the orchestra is gonna pick up from here. This was all keyboard, so I'll start from here. back into our little theme and we'll figure out how we're going to orchestrate it when we're actually orchestrating. So far, we're just a couple of rehearsal letters. We're on rehearsal letter 26. And remember, we went through a lot of rehearsal letters with the Prokofiev. All of this material came from rehearsal letter 26. And you know what? We could have written more and more, which I did, as you could see, all the way we finally get to rehearsal letter 27. So once you're connected and you've learned how to really open yourself up, you will not have writer's block. The hardest thing you're going to have to do is be able to write it down fast enough. That's going to be your biggest problem. And there's some interesting keyboard techniques here that I learned also, just in putting triplets against these guys. Also, I learned how to write better in Sibelius because I have a a genius composer in training that is working as my assistant, and he knows Sibelius real well. So he comes in and tells me, why do you spend 15 minutes on that? It's only 30 seconds worth of work. So <laughs> I have to make up a lie. I have to say, well, I want to spend 15 minutes because I'm really thinking. You know, it gives me time to think. The truth is he teaches me stuff. So here we go.
course, this would be bigger, the same theme. All right, we have to move forward here because we're running short of time. Okay, so 27, 28. These, these guys are kind of a lot of the same. We still have a lot of the triplet and the, the eighth feel against things. I'm going to get basic, real basic for all the guitar players out there. You keyboard players will sort of relate to this, but guitar players will really relate to this. You know how the great B.B. King felt about his guitar playing and his licks? He was asked once, how do you feel about it when these young guys, you go and you hear them and they're playing some of your licks? And B.B. said, I figure if you could play it, it's yours. If you can do these orchestration tricks, they're yours. Nobody's going to own an orchestration lick. Let's call it a lick, like a guitar lick. Okay, so here's here's a lick you're learning, triplets against eights. Okay, so this is what this sounds like. Same thing over and over. It's a very short theme, but it's different orchestrations, different little stuff against it. That was my big takeaway from this portion. All right, so we're at 20A here. Now, uh, remember I told you about chromatics. You can always use chromatics or just thirds or scale wise stuff against your main orchestration, that type of thing. I'm going to put the tremolo in the keyboard here. And I'm going to put simple clarinet line against this. And this will be a new part of the theme. Remember, I'm thinking I'm going to sketch. This is all sort of sketching for me. Okay, so that should give you a very good idea. 29 through 31, we sort of continued the same deal. I want to skip forward here, though, because you can see what I ended up writing on each rehearsal number is way more than what the rehearsal number had in it. I was using it as a gathering, and this is really important for you guys. You have to actually be connected to get all these ideas. And this is not me sweating over this stuff. I don't want to sweat in my life. I've been around the sun too many times. I want to enjoy my life, and that's what I want you to do. I want you to enjoy your life. So remember we talked about the swelling effect at rehearsal letter 30. I just want to get to this, and then... We're going to move on to another section. This was the sort of a swelling effect. Remember, we had these little swelling guys in here. And then we had the bass note that dropped out. These are different notes. These are different chromatics. These are different vertical chords. But I'm applying the rhythms because I wanted to get kind of a feel of how to use this 
chop. I try to make sure that I'm breaking up these rhythms in a way that are fun. So when the chromatic line comes in, remember the piano went higher. So this is higher than previous. And this is chromatic line. And the bass drops out. And we have the dynamics, the no low end orchestration here. And then it repeats. So let's see if we got a swelling effect here. Okay, so if our ability to hear just through the piano, I think if we had this in an orchestra, it would be very, very dramatic. This is great searching music, action adventure film, searching, you're searching, you've got this line that's going up here, and that can be in French horns or something dramatic, and all this other stuff is beautiful wallpaper. Once again, we are back to, this is the last thing that we're going to go over today of Prokofiev. I want you to see, though, remember, we had a bunch of numbers in the le rehearsal letter 31 of Prokofiev. That is an application, and I started analyzing and realizing, okay, I have different numbers than he had. I realized that your rate of dissension or your rate of ascension has to do with what you pick here. That seems obvious, but you can control it. And here's how you figure out, let's say you needed four bars of this instead of two. I just didn't feel like writing four bars. So you add up the negatives. So eight and minus four minus eight, that's minus 12. And then you add up the positive. See, this is coming down four and then up six and then down eight and then up three. So I'm, I'm adding these and I put them together. I get minus four plus minus eight, that equals minus 12. Then I'm going to add six plus three, that's nine. And the result is there's a minus three. So what's going to happen is that from here to here, we're going to be coming down in minor thirds or threes. And so we can judge how fast we want to go. This guy is not chromatic. He was chromatic in the rehearsal number 31 of Prokofiev. But I decided to change it because I wanted to come down a little faster. So I picked the octatonic scale here. And I have them marked in blue. Notice they coincide with those guys. So they're, this, these are a third apart. You can hear it. I mean, an octave in a third, but you can, you can kind of hear how they're, right? Just this little pattern against a tremolo. It's a little harsh because I'm not Lang Lang. So you can hear that is a very effective sort of cascading type of sound. And the orchestration is fairly simple. All right, so then we have the rest of these guys, which we'll have to pick up on our next session. Uh, we'll start with 32 and go through things. There's just a lot of stuff for you guys. It's all done there, and it's applied. There's no rehearsal letter that we haven't done application to. You need to get in, study it, make it yours. Every one of these licks will be better if you learn them because just like honing BB guitar, like some young guys come in, they learn the licks, then they add some cool stuff to it, and pretty soon it's a better lick than BB came, came up with. That's what Mita really wants out of all of our composers in training. So that is that beautiful theme that Prokofiev wrote. And this is where we are going to just review quickly. So you can see that there's a lot of explanation. The crux of this is putting a beautiful melody in octaves. Great orchestration always sounds wonderful that way. But also these sort of tremolos, how Prokofiev uses tremolo to accompany his piano.
Remember, we're going to just do this fast because we got to get up to where we left off last time. At rehearsal 27, we see the recap of the little theme here on clarinet, but they're partials. They're not the entire theme. And that keeps happening. Here it happens again. You can see. And then here the bassoon does it again. This is sort of just a little orchestration that Prokofiev uses to restate the theme without restating the whole theme itself. And here it is again with the clarinet coming in. And it's very pretty. Then he kind of lets loose on the piano. And I'll play this for you so you can hear what the reduction sounds like. Little passage of thirds. Also, we discuss these little articulations that are put in his piano part. These are definitely piano type of licks. I wouldn't put those in fiddles or anything like that. Then we had the swelling effect here, which we talked about. How do you create this swelling effect? And it sounds like this. It's a combination of lightening up the orchestration in a couple of ways, making it go very high, dropping the roots out of here and having a crescendo decrescendo. That is one technique that Prokofiev uses for that sort of feeling. And that would be a really nice way to use this little trick in animation, because in animation, all kinds of strange stuff happens. And it really affords you a, a medium to compose more music than maybe you normally would. It's one of the reasons why I like animation so much. Also, it was uh, made me a uh, very good living for a long time. The other thing about animation, I'll just say quickly, is that there's lots of music in animation. So since we're in a royalty-based business, it's a good business. And then we talked about how he's using the rhythmic values to get certain feels. And this rehearsal letter 31, really pretty, but it's mainly chromatic. When you go to rehearsal letter 31 in your studies, that's kind of what you're listening to. You want to have that little sort of mystic orchestration. This is one way to get it. And you notice how high he is on the piano. He's way up there. So and th this is just a chromatic line. This is not part of his orchestration. This is what's going on up here taking these guys and just looking at what the intervals are. We like to look at everything in terms of intervals. And so this gives you a chance to sort of just go through the rehearsal numbers. And so that's where we left off last time. And then this, this is the application of all of those. So you want to go through the application, write a little piece based on the technique. That's the best way to learn. If you're going to analyze someone, a composer that you respect, analyze a short section or a rehearsal number, and then try to write something in that style. So that's what we do. We show how the application of techniques that we gathered. Okay, these are all things that we gather. OI means outside intervals. So we take these structures and look at outside intervals. And what's the inside intervals? which is a meta technique of analysis that really frees you from having to put everything in a tonal center or that type of a thing. So this is all original composition based on those rehearsal numbers. This is an example of the polyrhythms he used. Interesting thing because Prokofiev, he's written a lot of pieces. His piece, Love for uh, Three Oranges, is kind of a famous piece. It shows that he has a sense of humor, even though he lived through two world wars and kind of had a tough life. In his music, he does a lot of the polyrhythm things. And so this was an example of that. And you can listen to his violin concerto, his classical symphony, and you see his style is these polyrhythms where he goes back, appears pretty straight eights, triplets, 
then the straight eights are down here. He kind of does that. So this was my attempt to kind of see how he did that. I'll just play this for you. You can hear how that sounds. It sounds just so broad. And when you put this in an orchestral setting, you really get that beautiful, broad feeling. And it's very romantic. So it'd be a place that you might want to go for ideas to write romantic music if you were working on a film or something like that. Okay, he also goes into free line writing. And so this is some little free line which is what the first lessons of the main course in music theory does. It introduces you to free line writing. And the whole idea is that you could go from vertical to free line, being in a tonal center to getting out of it. And free line writing is a very good way to be able to bridge all of those different sort of techniques. And we spoke about letting a thousand blossoms grow. That really means let yourself, let your mind connect to the creative pool. Don't let whoever is sitting on your shoulder interfere with that connection. Let the blossom grow. It may not be the best idea at the moment, but it's an idea. And out of that idea may come the best idea. That's a sort of a Zen way to approach your composition gets rid of all of the tension if you do that. So 28 was an example of how to use tremolo. 29 through 31 is a way to orchestrate your theme. This is sort of like the opening theme, putting these little orchestral 16ths against your theme. It's a good way to orchestrate. So then you can go into tremolo. So you come have this guy walking down and into a tremolo, just making your piece start to change texture, the comping texture behind your themes, which is always a very important idea. We actually just continued through this. I want to get to the next section. See, once again, we have these triplets with these different rhythms against things. He loves to do that. Down here, he keeps a big line going in the orchestra. That's a simple chromatic line. As you can see, the parts of it, it just goes chromatically. Then he shifts here a little bit against this complex rhythm sort of feeling that he has in the piano. And this is going to take us now to 32. And 32, this is the comping that Prokofiev uses. I'm going to play this. Okay, and of course, that line continues, that uh, piano line. This is the second time you're hearing this. You heard it in the very beginning. I think it starts at rehearsal number three, but he only played part of it. And so here at rehearsal 32, 33, and 34, he is building a line. And this is what we want to do. We want to build lines sometimes that last a lot of bars. And this is a really great little way to do that. Shows a little bit of the orchestration. If you listen to the uh, orchestration of the full orchestra, you can sort of check out what a, a single rehearsal number would sound like. And you see how long it goes. This line keeps going. We 
restate the main theme, which is this guy. As you can hear, it's quite fast. You have to be a good piano player. That's why Lang Lang is the guy that you should call for your piano concertos. He'll definitely get the notes, probably change a couple of fingerings for you. This takes us all the way through 37. And these analysis, these are all these numbers are the meta structures. The distance between these notes from here to here is an eight. So that's where that's coming from. So if I wanted to play this line, as you can see, these repeat. 8 minus 1, 5 minus 11, 1, 8 minus 1, minus 7. Well, they don't totally re repeat until you get over here. But this is a formula that you could basically start anywhere and duplicate this line. These guys are the vertical structures here. These are our vertical structures. Basically, this is PC. This is just changing the note that's on the top. Right here, it's the fifth, and here it's the root. Here's the minus three, and now we're back to the fifth on top. So these are just PCs, meaning position change, for those of you who aren't familiar with the meta terminology. So then we have the application of this whole series. So this is the application learning how to write a comping feel and changing it up using meta terms, so which is what we've done here. And this is this guy. So that's one plus four. That's where that comes from. And this is what it sounds like in a comping situation. Of course, this would be orchestrated. So that's an application. And the reason why I played that for you is so you get a study habit, learn a rehearsal number, extract the technique, spend time with that rehearsal number, and actually try to write a piece, a short piece. It doesn't have to be as close as this, but these are completely different notes, different rhythms, different comping, but influenced by the rehearsal letter or number rather. So that takes us into the theme again. This is the theme that you've heard. And so th this is actually what the orchestration of Prokofiev is now. And so you've heard this piece a couple of times. This theme, he has this long, roaring line. He keeps orchestrating it. Kind of like Ravel and Bolero. I mean, if you have to think about how long that piece was and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, he's genius in a way. When you're doing these lines, you know, a lot of times we have to create a swell or a crescendo in the orchestra, and you can do it a couple different ways. Dynamics is the easiest way. You just write the dynamic, you get louder. This is a little bit more sophisticated how to get this type of growth to continually add something more into the length of the segment to give you that swelling feel. And of course, you could combine it with dynamics then. So this is, this is where we kind of are today, is looking at what Prokofiev did, how it relates to some of 
our theories. One of our theories is, of course, because the overtone series doesn't really have between any two adjacent tones an interval of 13, we take the sort of position that let's avoid that interval in our writing. If we want that interval, we can certainly put it in. But generally, when there's a problem, it's that interval someplace, unless you're in a dominant sound or something. But I point out these little red marks here because these are areas where Prokofiev doesn't abide by that rule at all. He just goes ahead and writes the notes. These guys, for example, those guys are landing on the and of two. Would it be smoother if you avoided it? You probably wouldn't notice it other than in the long stroke, it would sound a little bit smoother. That's what generally happens. But they had no rule like this in the Russian conservatory. It was whatever you could play. If you could play it, those notes were acceptable. That's a personal view of music in general composition. If you want to accept that view, that's fine. In Mita, we try to avoid it because it's good training. It's good training to avoid that interval as best you can. So these are little piano tricks. We're switching hands back and forth. Really, these are kind of fast guys here. Okay, so that sounds like, wow, there's so much going on. Let me take a nap. No, you don't want to take a nap because there's some really exciting stuff buried in here. This stuff is great. And I have some of it marked in red. You see this? This little guy? He comes around every once in a while, and it gives you a long pulse. You know, one. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. It's in there. And then he breaks it up, and then he brings it back. As you can see down in here, he brings it back. I think when you're having these real fast passages in the piano, it's very nice to have something that basically gives you a long pulse, reminding me to tell you that you don't have to mark your notes in red like I do. You can see this little thing keeps going, and he keeps having this little statement, and so you start getting this feeling in it. Even though it's subliminal, there's so much going on in the orchestration. You want to have a lot of that. That's what gives your orchestrations a lot of quality. The other thing to point out is, once again, we have all of this compounded rhythm stuff going on. See, the orchestra is all straight ahead stuff here, and then he's got these triplets. That's a Prokofiev style. For those of you who really want to write a passage in that style, that's a big part of his style. He also loves chromaticism. You find chromaticism all through his compositions. You find chromaticism all through his compositions. And I just want to point out, look at some of these licks, how high they get. He's using the whole keyboard, every single note, almost to the highest guys, you know. It's way up there. A piccolo can barely make it. Here he has fragments of his theme in the composition. So you're coming out of this big piano thing. I'll play it from here. And then when we get down here, you'll hear this is this little theme that he's restating. So you hear that little theme. So you've heard it a bunch of times, but just fragments. And if you write and bring some of that stuff in, what's going to happen is people just will recognize it. And for a moment, even though the harmony is probably in a couple different tonalities at the moment, they'll hear that theme and feel like they're with you. I'm with you. I hear the theme. Now, this, these are simple triads. And these, this is like a piano lick. 
And this is something that he uses in the very beginning. He's using it again. It occurs in rehearsal letter 43 and 44. And it's, of course, here in 41. He brings it back. And it's kind of a way to restate, hey, I'm setting you up for the big end. I'm going to repeat this. His orchestration is very similar on all of these, with the exception that sometimes he'll use a tremolo or that sort of thing. But they're very similar. And you can tell that he was probably getting a little uh, tired and wanted to just wrap this thing up because he had two more movements to write. I don't know. Prokofiev was a pretty, pretty diligent guy. So that's probably not the case. And this takes us from rehearsal letter 42 through 52. It's really important that you know all of these rehearsal letters we have looked at because this is like a giant repeat of all of his thematic ideas, his main themes, the same sort of piano licks and builds. What you'll notice is that this all has occurred earlier, which we have notes here. So you can go back to those other rehearsal letters and really find out with the meta analysis. I didn't really include an application for this because we've already done the applications on this first movement. So this is not designed to teach you all about Prokofiev. It's to teach you where to go in Prokofiev and how to do it. That's what we are trying to do. We want you to be free from us and actually learn oh, this is how the Mita does it. We go in, we look at a rehearsal number, we find a technique that we really like or a sound or an orchestral style that we like, and we try to write a piece of that. If you do that, you're definitely going to learn something that you can put into your bag of tricks. And I call it a bag of tricks. That's really not right. It's in, it's your education because... The quote I always give, because I'm a basic guy, I like to talk from a kind of a playing field here. The great B.B. King guitar player, blues guy, he just said it all, that if you can play the lick, it's yours. And I sort of take that same feeling. If you can write these piano licks, then they're yours. And there's lots of them. I mean, we have lots of them. So this is the end of the first movement. What I want to do just quickly is show you the part one, because it's been a long time since we were at part one. And that's the beginning of this whole series. And just like everything else in life, the more you do it, the better you get. And so this was our beginning. You know, this whole piano concerto is in C. It's all white notes. And you're hearing this huge amount of music coming, and it's just all white notes. And you say, wow. You know, the little things like here, we have chromatic alteration. All of this is available. So these are all available to you. All of this analysis, then you'll understand all these numbers. And then you can decide if you want to continue on and take the main course, which is designed to turn you into a master composer. And a master composer for us, what that means is you really have command and you do not have any technical boundaries in your composition. It doesn't mean you know everything. It means you have no technical boundaries. The same thing that the great Russian piano school and conservatory when it was the Soviet Union did. They taught these young composers, which were just piano players at first, to learn their instrument so they had no technical boundaries. So master composer for us, the definition is that you're a composer with no technical boundaries. This is rehearsal number two. Here's this line that we are looking at. And you see, it's not very long, is it? It's shorter. So this is the beginning of the piano concerto. And of course, this line takes you into the theme So this is part one, and part one takes you all the way through. We have so much analysis here. And then, of course, there's a lot of application as well. 
and hopefully some ideas of gathering materials and your getting good work habits, building your work habit, learning how to study a composer instead of just getting the big score, diving in and trying to look at transposed instruments and figuring that out. We want you to be able to get right to it. This also breaks things down so you can get ideas for orchestration. Orchestration is always a big question mark for people. Here we start application of all of the gathered materials that we had done previously in part one. That's the fast way to learn. We may have spent a month and a half figuring something out and you get it in five minutes. Imagine. So if you look at Mozart died at 36 or 35, and imagine yourself and you're 25 years old and you feel like, well, I'm way behind where Mozart is. Not really, because he had to find it over the years, all this sort of stuff. If we can go in and save you time, that's what we want to do. And that's what this is designed to do. Help you get your work habits, your study habits. Study habits are the most difficult thing to be consistent on. You want to be consistent on your study habits. That's why we didn't go through Prokofiev in one webinar. It was four. And this is just his first movement. In this first attempt, we are perfecting our way of explaining how to go about things. So it's only going to get better from here. And Prokofiev will not be the only composer. We're probably going to take requests. I know we have one CIT who loves Mahler. Maybe Mahler will be our next victim, so to speak. So this is part of how we're doing things. We're gathering the materials from the analysis. Those gathered materials become part of a sketch of ideas. That sketch gets then developed into an orchestration. And so that is basically what you have access to. This is pretty much the end of the first movement. A lot of repetition in these last 10 rehearsal numbers. You can hear, you should get the piece, listen to it, go to the website, get these rehearsal numbers, look at the piece, analyze it, listen to it, try to write something like that. Just trust me when I tell you this, if you do what we're talking about, you will be able to apply it to any of your jobs, not just writing a piano concerto. There's so much that comes out of actually breaking something down, getting the technique and trying to write in that style.